Well, good morning, and thank you very much. And uh, Darren, it's interesting. They've got you and I. We should do a question period here, maybe, or something. Um, Darren and I just, until Thursday, were facing off against each other in the legislature, and we might be in different parties, but I can confirm he's a really good guy, a good Albertan, and uh, we, may not, we might not agree on everything, but he's doing his best. So thank you very much, Minister, for your hard work and, uh, and your comments. And thanks all of you for uh, your presence, especially those who are visiting us from abroad. Um, I, I always find it interesting you hold these conferences in June in Calgary, not in January, but that's... That's a smart thing. I should also point out, I'm joined by the official opposition energy critic, Prasad Panda, who um, has forgotten more about uh, energy issues than I will probably ever know. A uh, petroleum engineer originally from, uh, from India who has been, who worked here in Canada for SNC-Lavalin uh, and uh, Suncor for many years and is, offers great uh, insight and advice on these critical debates. Now, I was given the topic, uh, uh, global, dyna uh, global dynamics and opportunities in the emerging E&P cycle. Um, but I don't stand before you pretending to be an expert on global dynamics in uh, the energy industry. Uh, so my theme here is think globally but act locally. Uh, and I hope that we can, uh, Minister Billis and I, persuade you that uh, there is a hope for renewal in investment in the industry here in Alberta. But I want to begin by saying a word you don't, two words you don't often hear enough uh, from political leaders as uh, people in the oil and gas sector. And those two words are thank you. Thank you for what you and your companies do to create energy and to create wealth. You know, uh, I think for too long we have allowed this industry to be stigmatized by a campaign, frankly, of defamation that has been well organized uh, and that has been designed to target Canada in particular. Ten years ago, uh, at an office in New York City, the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation hosted a, a conference with some two dozen uh, environmental organizations to launch what is called the Tar Sands Initiative. The goal of which explicitly has been to landlock Canadian oil and gas. A campaign that has been executed with the support of hundreds of millions of dollars of foreign funds. One organization alone, the, alone, the Tides Foundation Canada, has received at least $80 million, uh, $80 million in funds from their counterpart foundation in the United States. Independent researcher uh, Vivian Krauss in Vancouver has detailed many of these uh, flows of capital into Alberta from foreign foundations uh, into, into Canada. Uh, the goal of which has been to influence Canadian policy ultimately uh, to bottleneck the third largest oil reserves and the fourth largest natural gas reserves on earth. You have to wonder why has Canada been targeted? I think the answer is very clear. It's because the uh, activists in, involved in the Tar Sands Initiative, which is ultimately targeting uh, all forms of um, hydrocarbon energy in Canada, not just bitumen, uh, these act activists understand perfectly well that they, their message is, will, will have zero impact amongst other major producers. Now, you know as well as I do that there is a growing global demand for oil and gas. According to the International Energy Agency, through at least the year 2040, they're projecting, and they confirmed this again last week, a 17% increase in demand for oil and gas. And so we know that uh, the normal laws of, of the market will apply, and that demand will be met. It will be met um, by... Venezuela and Saudi Arabia, by Russia and Iran and Qatar. The question is whether it will also be met by Canada. Now, this is, I submit, for this, this country, almost an existential polit uh, economic question. As we have an aging population and growing public debts, increasing health care costs, and a shrinking workforce relative to the retired population, we desperately need other sources of, uh, of revenue, of economic growth. And we have that in the third largest oil reserves in the world. So the case, 
for the economic case sells itself. But I believe there's also a moral case. Because you know, one of the reasons why we've been struggling with investment in Canadian oil and gas in recent years is precisely because we are, let's face it, a higher cost producer. We're a higher cost producer for a number of reasons. Our, predominant, our, our dependence on, uh, on tight oil and, and on bitumen but also because we're a big, we're a cold northern climate, you can't build, your, you can't do construction or exploration year round. We have high labor costs. We've always had a robust regulatory framework which adds costs. Those, but those should be seen as advantages. If global capital markets are becoming increasingly sensitive to the environmental dimension of oil and gas production, then we need to do a better job of explaining that Canada does have the highest and most robust environmental regulations and the greatest investment in research and development science and technology, which is helping us constantly, as you know, to shrink the carbon footprint, for example, of production in Canada and in the oil sands, a 30% reduction in the carbon intensity of a barrel of bitumen produced over the past three decades. So this is a good news story. It's a good news story, but we haven't been able to tell it very well, particularly in, face, in the face of this campaign of defamation uh, that has been uh, well-funded from foreign sources. So uh, when you talk about global trends, global dynamics, I think one global dynamic must be a serious concerted act of collective leadership at the federal and provincial level in Canada to ensure not only global access for our products, but that we um, uh, liberate this economy to, in, to make it friendlier for investment. You know as well as I do, I, would, I don't want to dwell on the negative, but in, in recent years we have seen a significant flight of capital from Alberta and Canadian oil and gas. Now it's true obviously that uh, the, the large decline in price in 2014-15 uh, instigated that. But it's also true that just in the last two years we've seen the flight of nearly 38 billion dollars of foreign capital from Alberta's oil and gas sector alone to oil and gas in other jurisdictions at the same global prices. Uh, one example I'd like to point to, which um, is startling for me, was that Total uh, liquidated their major investment in the oil sands only months later to announce a significant, or excuse me, a, a, a commensurate new investment in gas fields in Iran, which is a, to be blunt, a state sponsor of terrorism and a theocratic dictatorship. This means some brilliant people in Total headquarters in Paris effectively did a comparative risk assessment and determined that they could get a better rate of return uh, with greater certainty in gas fields in Iran than in Alberta's oil sands. That is not a situation that we should celebrate. That's, that's not a, that is not good for the world, uh, th neither environmentally nor in terms of uh, global stability. And, and uh, as you know, uh, I, I don't need to belabor this point, Rafi uh, Tazmazian of um, Canoe Financial said just last week that Canada is not even on the radar screen anymore. We used to be a jurisdiction where people would dial down risk would dial down risk by coming to Canada, and now these same investors, including myself, dial up risk when coming to Canada. So if that capital has moved from Canada's oil and gas sector to the sector in other parts of the world, what do we do to bring it back? Well, first of all, I think we need to recognize that this was driven not just by price, but I would submit also by policy. Uh, we, are, we, As I've said, we were already before this downturn, a high cost producer. And that was partly a reflection of our high, high envir environmental and labor standards. Um, so we need to maintain those standards, but we need to reform our regulatory system so that it moves at the speed of business, not the speed of bureaucracy. You probably know that um, Imperial Oil has been waiting for four years for approval for a $2 billion uh, cutting edge SAG-D development in northeastern Alberta. F four years is too long. Four, uh, we're just fortunate that they have been so patient with that capital. 
Producers tell me all the time that they can get approval for projects in Texas in a week where the same, a similar project can take months for approval in Alberta. And so uh, it is essential uh, that we uh, accelerate and reform and if necessary add resources to the approvals process uh, so that people can get, we can get to yes uh, in a reasonable amount of time. It's also important that we, we address some of the cost drivers. Property taxes have gone up uh, in, in Alberta, which are an additional uh, cost for, for, met, for producers. Uh, l uh, there have been recent changes in, in uh, labor policy as well uh, that are bending the curve in the wrong direction precisely when the, when the industry is trying to reduce the cost of exploration and production. Um, but of course, as Minister Billis has said, it's critically important that we do everything possible to get global access to markets uh, through coastal pipelines. And let me address this for a moment. Uh, so we're now, we, we're, uh, uh, production continues to increase thanks to massive capital investments, partly in the oil sands, producing uh, three and a half billion barrels per day. Uh, and of, as, as we all know, we're facing the significant price discount because of our uh, captive, uh, we're captive in our export markets to the United States. Uh, now, you would think that in that environment, governments would pursue a uh, robust strategy to seek multiple options for coastal pipeline access. But unfortunately, unfortunately, in the fall of 2015, the current federal government announced that it would be imposing a tanker traffic ban on the BC northern coast. That challenged in, uh, the, the approved Northern Gateway pipeline, which ultimately was subsequently vetoed. Uh, uh, and then, now there is Bill C-48 before the federal parliament that would entrench the tanker ban uh, into law. Uh, this needs to be repealed. Bill C-69 is the new federal uh, pipeline regulatory uh, legislation. It follows two years of intensive consultations. Uh, and according to the industry, will simply ask, uh, add to the cost and complexity of getting uh, pipelines approved. In fact, the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association has said that it will effectively make it impossible, to, to quote them, with, built, with respect to the imposition of up and downstream carbon emissions as part of the pipeline assessment process, quotes, with built-in climate change tests covering upstream and downstream GHG emissions, it is preposterous to expect that a pipeline proponent would spend upwards of a billion dollars only to be denied approval because the project must account for emissions from production of the product to consumption in another part of the world. If the goal is to curtail oil and gas production and to have no more pipelines built, this legislation has hit the mark. And so I renew our call on the federal government to hit the pause button on Bill C-69, which is currently before uh, the, the federal parliament. This will simply deepen the regulatory problem which led to TransCanada Pipeline cancelling Energy East uh, in October of last year. They did so following an August 2017 regulatory statement by the National Energy Board, determining that it was going to uh, move into the space and apply the, 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 an assessment of indirect up and downstream carbon emissions associated with the Trans-Canada Pipeline uh, Energy East project. Well, first of all, upstream emissions, the regulation of upstream emissions and production is, of course, under Section 92A of the Constitution, an exclusive jurisdiction of the provincial government. Uh, that's something that our former uh, Premier Peter Lougheed fought for and won in 1982. And it is a power that I believe the government of Alberta should jealously guard and protect. So this intrusion of a federal regulatory agency into the regulation of upstream production uh, through an indirect assessment of upstream carbon emissions is extraordinarily unhelpful. And secondly, downstream emissions, as SIPA has said, this makes absolutely no sense. We do not regulate the foreign oil shipped into Eastern Canada based on its ultimate consumption or the carbon emissions associated with that. And so why would we put our own Canadian producers at a comparative disadvantage, particularly when it is manifestly in our economic interests that we should be able to displace some foreign oil imports in central and eastern Canada uh, 
with Western Canadian uh, shipments. So uh, again, this is essential that we, we ask the federal government to t take a step back and look at the situation that we find ourselves in today. Uh, these bills and approaches, uh, the veto of Northern Gateway, the uh, intrusion of the National Energy Board uh, into up and downstream emissions that ended up uh, with the cancellation of Energy East, these policies were based on some kind of a grand bargain. We were told that if we did things like this, as well as to impose uh, carbon taxes on consumers, that we would get something called social license. Um, I submit that has been, and it's time for the proponents of this theory to admit that, regrettably, they were wrong. Perhaps it was worth an effort, but I have been unable to identify a single stakeholder, a single environmental organization, provincial government, political party, municipal government, First Nation, or activist that has gone from no to yes on pipelines and global access as a result of these policies that have inhibited investment in Canada's oil and gas sector. And so uh, these are uh, reasons why I believe we need um, uh, the federal government. The federal government now, yes, Minister Billis is right, has replaced Kinder Morgan as an investor, as the owner of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Uh, while at least this allows us to hope that the pipeline will be built, uh, there's a reason why this happened. It's because Kinder Morgan came to the conclusion that they were unable to get the certainty required to protect their shareholders' interest in that critical project. And this is not something that we should just walk past and, and, uh, and pretend did not happen. The, the, we need, surely, governments at all levels and political actors in this country should pause to say, what can we learn from this? Are we any closer to the certainty that is required uh, to see the construction of that pipeline? Regrettably, the government of British Columbia has not downed tools. They've tripled down in their threats to withhold permits and to take a litigious approach to do, to do quotes, everything possible uh, to prevent the construction of that pipeline. Municipal governments in British Columbia doing the same thing and a small minority of First Nations while the vast majority, of course, along the pipeline route support it. And so I believe it is important for both the federal and Alberta governments to continue to apply meaningful pressure uh, to the government of British Columbia to make it understand that it has a constitutional obligation to respect federal jurisdiction over the regulation of interprovincial infrastructure, and in this case, that pipeline. I believe the federal government could help to do so by invoking an extraordinary power in the Constitution, Section 9210C, the declaratory power, by determining that the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion is for the common advantage or in the national interest. There's actually a bill that has passed the Senate of Canada by a vote of 54 to 15, Bill S245, that is now before the House of Commons, that would invoke that declaratory power. Now, there's an argument amongst uh, constitutional scholars about whether that would be, uh, or how effective that would be, my view is use every tool in the toolkit and for greater certainty use that, invoke that extraordinary constitutional power. But I believe the federal government were really serious about this. Uh, they would use the power of the federal purse. The federal government recently signed a $4.3 billion agreement for discretionary infrastructure transfers to BC and is in the process of negotiating a $1.1 billion discretionary job training transfer uh, to the Victoria government, um, and $200 million in an environmental uh, transfer program. The same program has seen the federal government withhold $60 million in transfers from the government of Saskatchewan because it refuses to impose a, a carbon tax on that province. So if the federal government is willing to use the power of the purse to penalize provinces that are not part of its agenda on a carbon tax, why are they not using the power of the purse to exert pressure on a province that is violating our constitution, that is undermining free trade within the federation, and that is attacking Canada's vital economic interests. So I think, it, it, yes, uh, it is time to see serious leadership. This is not, by the way, just about a pipeline project. 
It is about whether we are, live in a country predicated on the rule of law as a central governing principle of our society. Can we allow provincial governments arbitrarily uh, to determine what products we export from our coasts? Uh, this is a violation of the vision of Canada at its founding a century and a half ago. And it's so I, I submit, I submit it's not enough simply to uh, replace shareholder risk with taxpayer risk. Uh, it, we still, we, it is, in fact, it's more important now from a public interest perspective that we see the exertion of meaningful pressure. Finally, let me turn to um, the, uh, the prognosis for Alberta. Uh, Minister Billis has uh, done an excellent job of articulating the approach of the, um, of the current Alberta government, and I respect that. It's my job as leader of the opposition to offer an alternative, and I've been working hard to do that over the past two years. In the next six months, uh, the party I lead, the official opposition, will be en engaged in extensive consultations to develop our platform, which will be released uh, before the next election in the spring of next year. And uh, just as industry consults with government, we would invite your input into that platform. The question I would ask you is, uh, what would constitute the optimal policy setting to restore investor confidence in Alberta's oil and gas sector? Uh, I, I hope and believe there is return of some confidence, uh, but uh, we need to increase it by orders of magnitude. It, it, I can give you some, over, slight, uh, some uh, indications of where we intend to go in terms of policy. Uh, certainly one aspect, uh, that really is more directed to consumers than the industry is that we will be, uh, as the first act of a prospective future government, repealing uh, the carbon tax, which does act, uh, add, I think, to the cost of doing business and production in some respects. But uh, I, what, what I really want to get from industry are ideas about how we can remove unnecessary or redundant regulation without lowering Alberta's environmental protection standards, and how we can accelerate the approvals process again to move at the speed of business? Are there fiscal policy levers that we should be using further to advantage or to uh, attract investor confidence? But fundamentally, we've been going through some challenging times, and yet I share uh, Minister Billis's optimism. Um, the industry in Alberta, in Canada, has been driven by, some, by remarkably brilliant and resilient, innovative people. Uh, and they, you, have helped to raise our standards of living, uh, to help to create prosperity in this province that we've shared right across the country. And I truly hope that governments working together, but being unapologetic about defending this industry, and through it, uh, the Canadians that depend on it for employment, uh, that we will see a significant return of confidence. Uh, and uh, I hope that, uh, that your deliberations this week will be the beginning of that. So thank you very much.